table, I do want to give you a very warm welcome to our uh, prayer and Bible study this evening. I know it's a, a bad night out there and we have a yellow weather warning and I uh, didn't know whether the roads were going to be flooded tonight or not, but thankfully they haven't been too bad. Uh, so I hope it's all right where, where, where you are, but just be careful, certainly making your way home this evening. Um, as well, and also for travelling about tomorrow. Uh, just a little reminder, the Good Friday service um, is on, uh, obviously, this Friday at 8 o'clock, and then there's communion after that um, as well, too, and then Easter Sunday services, as usual, at the usual times of 11, and also 6.30 as well. And just a reminder, also for those who help out in Kids Club, no Kids Club this week, okay, no Kids Club this week, but thank you for your prayers for uh, the school. I'll talk to, a little bit more about that when I'm coming on to the, the prayer time and some of the prayer points. Uh, but it was really well attended and certainly had an excellent reception in the school and the kids listened so well. Uh, so I have a few photos to show you a little bit later on about that as well too. So uh, let's pray together before we, we turn to God's word tonight. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks uh, you are going to be here tonight. Father, we we give thanks even for how you do watch over us, how you help us as well each day, how you not only save us by your grace, but sustain us by it too. And so, Father, we do, Lord, ask for your help, Lord, even for those who can't be here tonight just due to illness or other circumstance. Lord, draw near to them, just some of our regular members who would normally be here, just not too well at the moment. Father, just strengthen them, help them, be near to them. For others even who are grieving as well, we just are mindful of um, Rini's uh, family um, at this time. Lord, just um, we pray for them and the funeral tomorrow. Lord, comfort them. And Father, just draw near to them. We pray for the one ministering the word. Lord, that he will be, that he, as he shares of that word, Lord, that Christ will be proclaimed. And so, Father, we just ask, Lord, you help us once more as we turn to your word this evening. Father, as we come to receive the food of your holy word, Lord, just implant it deep within our hearts. Lord, even in this Easter period, help us, Lord, also as we seek to focus on the cross as well. And so, Lord, speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in our little series on some of the doxologies of the scriptures, um, some of these uh, short prayers, and um, we looked at how they were also a help to our own prayer life, and we looked at two of these previously. But tonight, strictly speaking, it's not actually a doxology we're looking at tonight. I'd mentioned about there's some of these short prayers are actually also benedictions um, as well. And tonight we're looking at a really familiar one, just one verse this evening, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. So what's the difference between a doxology and a benediction? A doxology is um, a prayer of praise directed to God, whereas a benediction is um, a prayer which is a blessing to over other people as well. So one writer defines it as a word from the Lord delivered through ministers of the word to his people for sustaining and strengthening them. A word from the Lord delivered through ministers of the word to his people for sustaining and strengthening them. So that's what a benediction is. It's a word of blessing, praying for God's blessing upon the people. So the very last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 13 Verse 14, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You know, it is such a simple benediction, that, isn't it? It's one of no doubt you've heard many, many times. But actually, it's maybe a little bit deeper than we think. Don't dismiss these simple words. And as I say, we sometimes have a tendency to do that, either when we get to an introduction of a book or even sometimes just the final verses because we think, you know, oh, these are familiar. But often there's some wee differences in them as well or there's just certain things that the writer's communicating through them. And you'll notice that this one begins with grace. Grace. And grace features prominently in all of Paul's letters. This book begins with grace, actually. If you, you look at 2 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verse 2, he writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's grace at the beginning. There's grace right at the end. And yet grace was something that was badly needed in the church of Corinth. Let's consider what we know about Paul and the history of the church there. Um, what we have... Oh, was there... 
battery's gone, or I might have my other clicker known as Henry, if he can click through that. Thank you. So, um, in Acts 18, read of the background in the church. Oh, it's computer's frozen. Has it? Yep. Maybe even just escape that and start it up even again. In Acts 18, we read of how the church began in Corinth when Paul went there after leaving Athens. And he stayed uh, with a couple called Aquila and Priscilla. And there he evangelized both Jews and Greeks. And then Silas and Timothy also joined them. And though they faced resistance, thanks Henry, though they faced resistance, there were many who were believed and were baptized. And Paul uh, faced great opposition there at Corinth. And here we see some of the the ruins uh, at Corinth. It was a really secular city, a city of great trade, a city that was seen as being a real city of culture. And, you know, people saw themselves as culture being, it was a city filled with philosophers and these very impressive public speakers. So of the day, um, the, the kind of celebrities or the pop stars of the day would be these great public speakers. They held these debates and people were well, well respected for, for how they spoke. And Paul, even Paul, great, the great preacher Paul, felt a bit intimidated himself when he came to Corinth. He talks about actually going there in fear and trembling. But the Lord, it says, strengthened him and, and, and encouraged him not to be afraid, but keep on speaking and not be silent. So we'll read about that in Acts 18. But this was Paul's pastoral heart because he stayed in touch with the church at Corinth. Even though he had a difficult time when he was there, he wrote a letter to them because he'd heard about divisions that were in the church. So they were divided over personalities, uh, who they followed. They were divided even over certain doctrinal issues, even uh, such as spiritual gifts. And Paul was really trying to urge them, be united in Christ. So in his first letter, he focuses very much on Christ. So 1 Corinthians 1, he talks about the cross uh, being the wisdom and power of God. And he writes to them also about love, that very famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, which you sometimes hear at weddings, but it's actually the context of it, actually very different. It was meant to be, it was meant to be an encouragement for believers in a church who were were literally divided and arguing with one another to urge them to love one another. Um, But Paul visited this church again, and now he writes this second letter after others were criticizing Paul and his ministry. So look back to the previous chapter, um, chapter 12, verses 14 to 21. So what we see here in verse 14 of chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, it says, Paul's ready to come to them for a third time. So he's getting ready to come to them. And then he reminds them of his motives, verses 17 to 18. He says, look, I didn't take advantage of you, and neither did any who you know, he sent to them. Others were trying to accuse Paul about his motives. But Paul is a little bit afraid of almost what he's going to find when he comes. Verse 20 of chapter 12, he says, For I fear, perhaps when I come to you, I might not find you as I wish, and that you may not find me as you wish. So he thinks when he comes, maybe there's going to be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. You fancy being a member in that church, listen to that. And he says, I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. And I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality and sensuality they've practiced. You see, the world was coming into the church. And this church was, it was a bit of a mess. And Paul is writing to them out of, of love. You know, he's afraid of what he's going to find when he comes there. But also he says, you know, if you're getting on like that, you're maybe not going to like how I'm going to be whenever I come. Because he was going to address them directly. Even in in, uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 5, he says, look, even examine some of you whether you're truly saved. So this is a, a strongly worded letter. Paul really, you know, this is a church where they're not bringing glory to Christ by how they're living. And Paul is really addressing that sin here. He's writing to them and dealing with them. But his desire is he's reaching out to them in love. Verse 9 uh, to 10. Paul wants to, he wants to really, he wants to come that I, I, I may not have to be severe, he says, in the use of authority that the Lord's given to me. In other words, he doesn't want to come with a heavy hand to them. He's praying for their restoration. He's longing that they correct their behavior. And so this is why Paul finishes with these words in verse 14. 
as one writer remarks, this is like the um, this is like the note he wants left ringing in their ears at the very end. You know the way sometimes uh, if you've ever been to uh, a, a concert with a, an orchestra, uh, you know this is like the final note he wants he wants them to remember as he goes. So in the midst of a chapter and a book where he's really addressing the sin that's in going on in the church, he wants to finish reminding them of the grace of the Lord. So there's this verse, and I think we've got the clicker hopefully back, can we? So this is the, the verse here we see, and there's something you notice about these these verses here. What's significant is there's some themes he brings out here. There's grace, there's love, and fellowship as well. Things he's brought out right through this letter. Grace, how they need to have grace with one another. And in, in showing them this, he's going to remind them of the grace of the Lord. So you know he's going to really bring that point. If the Lord showed grace to us, we need to show grace to others. He's going to remind them of love. He's also going to remind them of fellowship as well too. And we'll talk about these for a little moment. But I've called this a triune blessing because that's the other thing you notice. Notice how each of the persons of the Trinity there. So there's Jesus Christ there and the Son and then God the Father in the middle and then the Holy Spirit in the end there as well. So through the Trinity, each person, of course, each person in the Trinity is distinct, but they're all equally divine. But each part of the Trinity is involved in our salvation as well too. So let's take a moment just to consider each of these. So the first one, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what strikes you here is the order. The order is actually a little bit different. Normally you think of the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul actually mentions Jesus then first. So Paul repeatedly in these two letters, part of the reason I think behind that is he's been urging them to focus on Christ. That's how he began his first letter, 1 Corinthians 1. He's urging them to focus on the cross, focused on Christ. Remember what they possess in Christ. Remember their identity in Christ. And then he began his, his first letter that way, even with the necessity of the cross. He goes on to talk about the cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ as a foundation of his ministry. And so maybe that's why he begins this way. Even when he confronts their sin, he reminds them of who they are in Christ. And he's basically saying, if you're a true believer in Christ, you shouldn't be living this way. Again and again, he comes back to the gospel of Christ. Actually, there's, there's this phrase, um, our Lord Jesus Christ, comes up repeatedly in First and Second Corinthians. Um, and even in this second letter, when he talks about giving in order to help other believers, he comes back to grace. And he reminds them of the grace that God has shown in Christ. And this verse, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, is one that's, that's very familiar to us because it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, and that you by his poverty might become rich. The context of that little verse is um, the church had basically promised to give a gift to help other believers. And uh, Paul was talking about how the Macedonian believers had, give, had been giving to help others as well too. Other believers who were struggling even due to persecution. And although the Macedonians hadn't much, they were seeking to use that to, to help another brother and sister in Christ. And yet Paul points them to the ultimate example of grace. It's Jesus himself. Now, grace is something that's, that's undeserved. It's something that grace was displayed through Christ. The fact that Jesus was willing to come to this earth, to take on human flesh, to be despised and rejected, to suffer for us, to be raised in order that we as sinners could be res rescued and reconciled to God. And that is grace. The fact that he would do that, because the fact he would do that even for those who are sinners... For people who are undeserving of it, he showed grace towards us. You know, the fact of what he went through, he did that, that we could be reconciled to God. He did that for us. And here's the thing, Paul's reminding him of this grace because, you know, when we first received the message of the gospel, that's how we've experienced this grace. When we trusted in Christ, when we realized of what Jesus has done for us, when we realized that we need him as our saviour, we experience that grace because we realize what he's done for us. 
He's been willing to humble himself for us. And now we're, we're, we're spiritually rich in Christ. Think of all that we have in Christ Jesus. Forgiven, cleansed, pardoned, with a heavenly inheritance. From now a new family as well in Christ Jesus. We, we could go on here in this. And this is the grace that God has shown through Christ Jesus. You know, but why would God do this for us? Why would he send his son to show this grace, to be willing to die even for those who, who don't deserve it? Well, it's all really because of our, of our next phrase, because of the love of God. The Father, so we've looked at the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and there's this repeated emphasis to focus on Christ, and, and this is like the note that Paul wants them to finish on. This reminder of grace, remember the grace you've been shown through Jesus. And why have we been shown this grace? Well, it's because of the love of God the Father. And how do we know the love of God? Well, you think of the number of verses you can think of in the love of God. And probably one of the most famous that's going to come to mind is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. It reminds us of the depths of God's love, the greatness of God's love. And that love is so clearly expressed in God in giving of his Son. But I wonder, do we ever really consider of how much we're loved by God? Could it be that we've got so used to singing about God's love that, that maybe we've forgotten its true impact on us? You know, when you think of all the, the songs maybe you hear on the radio about love, the kind of love that the secular songs sing about is not like the love of God at all because the love of God again and again we read it's like a steadfast love a love that doesn't change now think of the encouragement and comfort that gives us you know people talk uh, in our world today about loving something and then the next minute they, they, they fall out of love but no God's love for his children is a steadfast love that love doesn't change even when you stumble, God in his love wants to reach out and restore his children. Don't you see it again and again, even in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament as well too, how he sent, even in the Old Testament, um, the prophets again and again to try and urge those who, whenever they strayed, to bring them back to the Lord. This is the steadfast love we're talking about, that even when they sinned against God, God wanted to restore them and bring them back again. That's the love of God. And one commentator, a man called Lenske, he asks, he says, if the sinner bows his head at the pierced feet of the Lord, he, he does that because he is so overwhelmed by the grace, shall he not be utterly lost in this ocean of love which is as great and blessed as God himself? When you think of the cross, when you think of what God has done in showing his love, and the cross reminds us of that love. You know, even when we are at our most darkest and difficult times when we're going through that that difficult trial you know there's times when we can be tempted to say you know well does God still love me in this moment you know surely this shouldn't happen if we ever are tempted to doubt God's love we know need only look back at the cross because that's how God has shown his love by giving of one that was dear to him for us that's how he proved that love to us God loves us you know and we through that love then receive, we can receive that eternal life. But what's the result then of the love of God expressed? So there's a grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he was willing to go to the cross, even to die for those who, who really didn't deserve it. And then there's the love of God expressed through giving of his son. What about the outcome of that? Well, it's this word fellowship, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And in some translations, this word fellowship it can also be rendered as communion it's talking about really a close companionship and there's two dimensions really to that because when we come to christ and turn from our sin and trust in jesus god grants us his spirit to live within us as believers but so that's one dimension to it but the other is that not only do we have this intimate and close relationship with the father and if you want to read more about that um look at uh, even the 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 upper room uh, account in John 14 to uh, 16 where, where Jesus talks about this close fellowship and even the high priestly prayer in John 17 
where he talks about, you know, what it means, the fact that the Holy Spirit's going to come live within them, to be guided, to even instruct them, to even comfort them as well too. And that's a tremendous privilege. But also the other dimension of that fellowship is it's something we share with fellow believers because they have the same Spirit dwelling within them. And Paul's challenging these believers who were, were quick to criticize fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And he reminds them of who they are in Christ. And in his first letter, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, here's what he says to them. When he challenges them about the way they're getting on, he says, Do you not know your God's temple? In other words, uh, God's spirit, as he says here, is dwelling in you. God is dwelling in you through his spirit. You're, you're God's temple, his, his dwelling place, his presence is dwelling within you. And he's reminding them then, you know, because that spirit dwells within them, that's something they share. They share. See, there should be close fellowship, not just between us and God, but also between one another. And if our relationship with our, our brother and sister in Christ isn't right, could it be that that other relationship isn't right, maybe between us and God? Could it be something's went wrong there too? Often you do find that they're connected. And notice also the final bit of this prayer. Again, we can focus in the first wee, uh, few aspects of it, but we can actually forget the final bit. It says, in the, the, the grace uh, of the uh, Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, why do I highlight that? Remember the context I just told you about. Paul is writing to church here and they were focused on some were you know, criticizing Paul. Uh, they were criticizing his mo uh, motives, criticizing his methods. They were at one another's throat. Some were saying, I'm following Paul. And others were saying, I'm following Apollos. And as Paul saying, you know, I pray that you would know the Lord's grace all you are following me. Is that what Paul finishes this letter? No, he doesn't. He says, with you all. He prays that all the believers that know this, that know this, that all would know of this grace, all would know of this love, all would know of this fellowship. There's no exemption clauses. And he's praying it even for those believers who made his life difficult. He's praying for those who are even who made his life difficult. He criticized them. Really what he's praying in this prayer is he's longing that people would be shaped by the gospel. See, the prayer then is that they would remember this grace, that their lives would be impacted by this grace, because if they receive grace, they should show it to others. Be willing to forgive the brother or sister who has wronged us. Why? Because Christ has forgiven us. To be willing to put our brothers and sisters even before ourselves, to be willing to put their interests even before our own. Why? Because that's what Christ has done for us. He has shown humility and we're to have that same mind in us. Philippians 2. What about love? They consider the love that God has showed them and if they truly consider this and are shaped by it, that should shape that they love one another. And as they consider the fellowship they have with God, the privilege and close fellowship that the Spirit dwells within, that should motivate them to consider the closeness of fellowship with one another. See, this is what Paul's really saying. Let your life be shaped by the gospel. It's not just something that you pray in a moment when you're saved and then go on and forget about it. That's not what Paul is saying. We need to, as I've quoted this before, but the writer Jerry Bridges has said, you know, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. It's not just for the unsaved. It's for us daily. We need to be living in light of the gospel. See, Paul recognized when he urges that they be united, that wasn't going to be possible unless they were brought back to who they were in Christ and what he'd done for them. The fellowship that was broken could only be restored if God did it. The mending of broken relationships, you see, lies within the grace of God, within the love of God, and within the Spirit's fellowship. As one writer, uh, a man called Dan Ortland remarks, he says, We must marinate in the gospel, considering the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, all of which are ours. And as we do, he says, we can move towards other believers, the lovely and the unlovely, in peace and in harmony. So Paul's prayer is that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would grant them grace, love, and fellowship. 
And what was the purpose of they have those things? That they would better glorify the Lord and that they would better serve him. So what a good prayer to pray for us. That we would know the love of the Lord Jesus, or the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and that our lives would be shaped by them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this simple prayer, this simple blessing. And we pray, Lord, that we would be blessed by it as well, that we would live our lives in light of the gospel. And help us even just to, just to think in these things. Help our lives to be shaped by it. And Father, help us to glorify your name that we may serve you better. Help us, Lord, to show grace to others, for we have been shown grace. Help us to love others, for you've shown love to us. Help us to have that fellowship, Lord, that we should have as a church because of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. So, Lord, be glorified even in our gathering together, even now as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.